Hi and welcome to this video. We're going to start a new series on embedding methods for, for NLP, but we're also going to have a look at other embedding methods as well. So mainly we're going to be focusing on, on language dense embeddings. We might have a look at sparse embeddings, but we've already covered that before. So I'm not 100% sure on that, but definitely dense embeddings. We're going to also have a look at how we can build dense embeddings for images and maybe some other media formats as well. So I think this series of, of articles and videos will be will be pretty exciting. Now, what I want to start with is having a look at, well, basically quickly introducing what dense vectors and dense embeddings are. And whilst we do that, I'm going to refer a lot to word to vec because that's the, the first widely adopted version of this. And then we're going to have a look at uh, sentence embeddings. So how we can build sentence embeddings using the sentence transformers library. And we're going to go through the code for that as well. Then we're going to have a look at Q&A. So Q&A is quite interesting, I think. And we're going to focus on Facebook AI's dense passage retriever for that. And again, we are going to go through the code for that as well. And then another thing that I think is, is quite exciting is image and text embeddings. So to do that, we're going to have a look at the new vision transformer. So I think all of that's pretty cool. So let's jump straight into it. So I think the first question we, we want to ask is why would we use dense vectors in the first place? Now we have two options when it comes to representing text and that is we can represent it as a dense vector or as a sparse vector. Now sparse vectors are good if we're going to focus on the syntax and the words that we're comparing. So if we had two sentences, Bill ran from the draft towards the dolphin. And then we said the opposite. So Bill ran from the dolphin towards the giraffe. Both of these sentences have the exact same words in, but they have different meanings, right? So in one of them, Bill is running away from a giraffe and the other one is running away from a dolphin. Now, when it comes to sparse vector representation, we'd find it difficult to correctly identify these as not being the same sentence because we tend to represent words one by one in some sort of one hat encoding and then compare those vectors. Now we can also use n-grams so we can put two words together and in that case we would identify that there is a difference but it's not that effective. And then we also want to consider where we have different words for the same meaning. So for example if you want to say hello to someone say hi, hello, hey, I'm sure there's a million other ways of saying it and sparse vector representations would view these as different words. So whereas sparse vectors are very good for or comparing the syntax of text, it's not very good at comparing the semantics or the meaning behind text. And that's where we want to start using dense vectors. So we, we can see dense vectors as pretty much a numerical representation of the semantic meaning behind some text. And we can actually visualize a lot of these relationships. So towards around 2013, we had word spec, which was the first very popular dense vector embedding for words. And around that time, we had a lot of people showing that you had things like this, what you can see on the screen, where, for example, we'd have days of the week clustered together, or we would have months or other related abstract topics represented or clustered together in our highly dimensional space. Now, of course, this is a 3D graph. When we're actually building these dense vectors, we have many more dimensions, more towards the 500, 700, 800 or so. So this is a obviously a simplified version of that. And not only will we find that similar words are clustered in the same area, but we also find that we can perform what I think is best described as 
arithmetic on words. So this is a very popular example uh, that came from around the same time as the words spec. If you want references and, and everything, you'll be able to find them at the bottom of the article that this video is attached to. If you need the article, it's in the description. Now, what we'd find is if we took the, the vector for king, subtracted the vector for man, added the vector for woman, we would not get the exact vector for queen, but we'd get very, very close. So the nearest vector would be the vector for queen. And I mean, I, I think that's super interesting. And this is from the start of when we had these vector embeddings. So this is eight years ago now, and they've just gotten a lot more advanced in that time. So as I said, these are these are coming from these examples are coming from the, the era of the word to vec. And word to vec was one of the earliest versions of these dense representations. And going from the name, we know it's word to vector, so we're converting words into into vectors. Now, how this worked, there were two different methods. We had the skip gram method, which is what you can see now, which is where we take one word and we would take the sparse vector encoding for that word on the left that you can see. And then we would, in the vector on the right, we would have a one hot encoding for all of the words that surround that first word. So in this case, we have fox, and that's surrounded by the words quick brown, jumped, and over. And this would be run through a, a simple feed forward neural network, and we would go through this compression stage. And it is within that compression stage that we would build our dense vector representation for fox. And that would simply be a, a neural network being optimized to go from fox and predict the quick brown jumped and over. And this would be done many times over for every time that word appears in a big corpus of text with its multiple contexts. And what that does is it just builds up like a, a numerical representation of that word. And then there is the other approach, which WordSpec also use, which is called continuous bag of words. And it's basically the same. We're just swapping the order of the transformation. So on the left, we have all of our context words. And then on the right, we would have our the word that we're focusing on and we're building the embedding for. Now, words vec really seem to act as the catalyst for a lot of other vector embeddings from word to vec, for example, we have like sentence to vec, doc to vec. We even had this one that I found when I was researching for this, which is called batter picture to vec, which is vector embeddings for major league baseball players. So you got a lot of different two fec methods that came out of the woodworks after the original word spec. And then we also had other ones like glove as well, which is, is worth a mention. Now, nowadays word to vec is pretty outdated and we wouldn't really go ahead and use that. So I'm not gonna spend any more time on it and we'll just move on to having a look at sentence similarity. So we can see sentence similarity as very similar to word to vec in that we're building these, these dense representations, but rather than representing a single word, we're representing a, a sentence or a paragraph. And the way that this would be done is using the current transform models. So Bert was the, the first example of, of doing this. And Bert by itself, you, you can build embeddings, but it's based on a token by token embedding. So within Bert, you have all of these different embeddings, but they each represent a single token. So what the guys at Sentence Transformers did is they trained like a Siamese, they call it Siamese BERT, where they had two BERTs and they were trained in parallel and they output a single vector for the full input that was input into the, into the model, which was around 128 tokens at, at max. Now, this allowed us to, to build a single inve single vector for full sentences. And, and that's very good because then we can start comparing sentences and paragraphs. So 
let's have a look at how we can actually build that in, in code. So the, the first thing you'll need to do is pip install sentence transformers. Now I've already done this, so I'm not going to rerun it, but if you don't have sentence transformers, you will need to install it. And then after that, all we want to do is we want to write from sentence transformers. We want to import the sentence transformer object. And from there, we can just initialize our model. Super easy, we just write model, sentence transformer. And then in here, we just need to type our model name. Now, on, if, you, if you Google sentence transformers or SBIRT, you will find the web page for this library. And it has loads of different models on there. That one of the highest performing ones that I found on there at the moment is called all mpnet base v2. Okay, so we just execute that. And usually you will need to download the model. So you, you will see a load of loading bars or progress bars. That's fine, it's just downloading the model for you. I already have it downloaded, so I don't need to run it again. And then what we need is a set of sentences so that we can actually compare what we're, what we can compare these and, and look at what the sentence transformer believes is the most similar. Now, all of these are completely random, but we have this one here. The bees decided to have a mutiny against their queen. And I, I just rewrote that in a way that we don't have any matching words between the two sentences. So we have flying, singing insects rebelled in opposition to the matriarch. Now, the meaning there is pretty much the same, maybe not exactly the same, but pretty much but there are no shared words other than I think two and the, uh, yeah, two and the. So it's in terms of sparse vector encoding, this wouldn't score very well. But we'll see that with dense vectors, it, it will. So the first thing we want to do is encode our embeddings. So we write embeddings because model dot encode sentences. Okay, and then let's have a look at what, what the outputs, or, or at least the shape of what it outputs. And we see that we get uh, seven vectors or seven embeddings, each one with a dimensionality of 768 values. And we can use cosine similarity to compare all of these. Now, the easiest way to do this is we just import cosine similarity from sentence transformers. So sentence transformers dot util import cos sim. Okay, and then what we do is calculate the, the cosine similarity scores between all of our vectors. Now I want to compare the final item here, so this last one, against the rest of them, because I want to see that this is the most similar. So I'm just going to select that. So write embeddings, and we're just taking the last vector. And then I want embeddings, oh, well, the remaining of them, so all the vectors except from the last one. And let's just have a look. We will be able to see that we have uh, something that seems pretty obvious. So this one here is the most similar by quite a bit, 0 0.6. The closest is 0 0.19 here. So it's definitely calculating that is a lot more similar than the other ones. So if I if I take the argmax of that, we should see, so three and take the item. And if we go sentences and we, we put that so sentences, we index number three, we see, okay, so the bees decided to have a mutiny against their queen. So it correctly identified that these two, this and this are far more similar than the rest of the sentences, which I think is very cool because 
there's not even any similar words in there. And even as a human, it's kind of, you know, the bees flying, flying, singing insects and matriarch and queen. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not obvious. So I think that's really cool. Another popular use of embeddings for language applications is question answering. Now, question answering can be done with a few different, let's say, architectures. And one of the, I think, most popular ones is open domain question answering. Now, the structure of open domain question answering is what you can see on the screen at the moment. So we ask a question that gets passed to something called a retriever model. The retriever model contains a question encoder, which encodes the question, passes it along to uh, our index database. And within there, we will have a set of contexts. Now, contexts are usually a, a paragraph that contains the answer to our question. And DPR both encodes our questions and encodes our contexts into the same vector space. So what we would get is, for example, if we had a question, what is the capital of France? And then we also had a context, the capital of France is Paris. DPR would attempt to encode both of those into the same vector space or very, very close by. So the vectors produced by both of those would be very, very similar. So that's so all we're doing in that index database is finding the most similar embeddings to our question embedding. And then from there, we, we pass that along, we pass our context and the question again to our reader model. Uh, here I've, I've used a BERT QA model. It doesn't have to be BERT, it can be any reader for question answering. And then that outputs the specific part of our context which contains our answer. So in the previous example, we would output Paris, hopefully. Now we had that DPR retriever model. A DPR is Facebook AI's dense passage retriever, and it actually consists of two smaller encoders. We have question encoder and a context encoder. Now during training, what we do is we train both of these encoders in parallel, and we pass questions and their equivalent context to the question and context encoder respectively, and we optimize based on a contrastive loss function. So we, we compare the vectors from our question encoder and the context encoder, and we try to minimize the difference between them for question and context pairs. And, and that's how we build the, the DPR model. That's why it works for question answering. So it's not like our sentence transformers where they are just a single model and they're used to identify very similar sentences. This is used to identify not very similar sentences, but very similar question and context pairs. And we will see the difference in, in a moment when we, when we go through the code. So let's get started with that. So come down here. And first thing we probably want to do is initialize our context encoder and our question encoder from DPR. Now we're going to use the hooking face transformers library for this. So if you do not already, you'd have to pip install transformers. Now, if you pipped installed sentence transformers, that does include transformers as a prerequisite. So if you installed that already, you should already have transformers as well. So first thing we want to do is from transformers, we want to import a fair few, a fair few classes here. So we need both the model or the encoder and the tokenizer for each, for both our context encoder and our question encoder. So let's do the, the context encoder first. So write DPR context encoder tokenizer and DPR context encoder here. And then as well as that, we also want the, the question encoder tokenizer and question encoder. So we write DPR question encoder tokenizer and also DPR question encoder. 
And that's all we need to import. So let's run that. And then we can go along, we can go ahead and initialize our tokenizer model. So we have the context model. Now this is going to be the DPR, DPR context encoder from pre-trained. If you've ever used Hugging Face Transformers before, you should recognize this from pre-trained. We're just going to load in a model, which we can find on the huggingface.co slash models website. So if you go to that address and you type in what I'm about to type in, you, you will find that it comes up. So I'm going to type Facebook slash DPR context. So T CTX encoder and we want single NQ base. And I'm going to copy this because we are going to use it again in just a moment for our context tokenizer. So context tokenizer equals DPR context encoder tokenizer from pre-trained again, from pre-trained. And then again, we, we want the same, the same model name in there. Okay, so they are our, our context side of the model, but we also need to get the, the question side. So we've got our context encoder and tokenizer. Now we want the question encoder and tokenizer. So right question here and here, and we're just replacing everything where we've put CTX with, with question in here. So it's this question and this as well. And then in the, in the model, we, I just replacing CTAs again with question. So pretty straightforward. Now I'm going to run that with you. It will, if you haven't already got these cache on your machine, it can take a little bit of time because we're downloading four sets of, of models and tokenizers. So it can, it can take a little bit of time. Now I already have them, so I don't need to, I don't need to wait for that. Now, first thing I want to do is set up a set of questions and context. So I have three questions here where well, you can read them. I'm not going to go through them all. And then we have context. Each question has a couple of contexts that are kind of relevant, but then just one that is actually the answer. And we also have inside here, I've also put in the questions themselves because I want to prove that this is not just a sentence transformer where it's finding the most similar sentence, right? So it should, when we have these questions, it shouldn't return, like for this one, it shouldn't return what is the best selling sci fi book. It should instead return the best selling sci fi book is Dune. So we should see that there is a difference between using DPR and using sentence transforms. So run that. And then what we want to do is, is tokenize everything. So we're going to tokenize our context. So I'm going to write XB tokens and we want the context tokenizer. And then in here, we're going to pass our context. And then if you, if you use hugging face transformers, you, you should recognize this as well. So max length here. So for this, I'm just going to put two, five, six, and I'll set padding equal to max length. We don't need to truncate anything. I don't think, no, it's, they're all very short. So uh, this max length, we could even reduce it to something pretty small, but I'm going to leave it at that. So we'll pad up to the max length and oh, the only thing we do need to include here is that we want to return PyTorch tensors. So ret return tensors equals PT. Okay. And then what we can do is we write XB embeddings. So this is how we build our embeddings, our, our context embeddings. XB embed, I'll just call XB is equal to model, the context model. 
CTX model. And then in here, we pass our tokens, XB tokens, like that. And then for our questions, we do exactly the same thing. But of course, we, we just replace our, the context part of it with, with questions. So here we have the question tokenizer. We have questions. And we have the uh, question model. And then here I'm going to rename XB to XQ. So our, our query. Okay, let's have a look at what we get. So first, let's have a look at what we have inside XQ. So we'll see that we have a few different tenses in here. So I'll just write XQ keys to see what we have. You can see that we, we actually only have one output here, so the pooler output, which is fine because that's, that's what we need. So we write XQ pooler output. And this is, these here are our embeddings. So we can write shape to see the shape of those embeddings. So we have three vectors. So the number of questions that we pass up here. And each one of those questions has been encoded into a embedding of 768 dimensions. So that looks good. And we could do the same for XB if we want as well. It's exactly the same. So right, XB and we'll see the shape. Uh, just at this time, we have nine vectors because obviously we have more, more context than we do with questions. So what we what we want to do now, I'm going to import Torch. So again, this should have been installed already with Hugging Face uh, Transformers and also Sentence Transformers. So if you've gotten this far, you don't need to worry about uh, pick installing this. And what I'm going to do is go for I and then the query vector in XQ, XQ pooler outputs, pooler output. Just want to enumerate that. So all I'm doing here is I'm going to run through, I'm going to create a loop to go through each uh, query and to get the, um, the most similar vector from XB, so from our context, encoded context. So we write probs equals cosine similarity. So these are our, our similarity scores, doing exactly the same as we, as we did before. And we're just going to write xq vec, so the single vector at the moment. And from here, we, we just want xb pooler outputs, pooler outputs. And from there, we want to get the argmax, so the, well, the, the maximum argument, so the, the the highest score in our probability array here. So torch argmax, and then here we have props. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print the current question that we're asking. So questions I, and then I'm going to print the, the context, which has been chosen from our argmax. So we just write context argmax. And then I'm just going to, I'm going to Put this in here so we have a little bit of separation. Let's have a see what we have. So we get what is the capital city of Australia? Now remember this exact question was also in our context, and it's not returning the exact the the exact a sentence back to us or the exact question back to us. It's actually returning us the answer. So Canberra is the capital city of Australia. Now second one. As we had hoped, the best-selling sci-fi book has been chosen to do in here. And then I just wanted to include this one as well to point out that it's not perfect. It, it doesn't it doesn't always get things right. So in this case, it, it didn't find the correct answer of how many searches are performed on Google. If we have a look at the context, so the, the correct answer should have been this one here. So Google serves more than 2 trillion queries annually. So it didn't get that one, but it, the other two it did get, despite having the actual questions in there as well, or here. So again, I think that's really cool. And I think Q&A is something that has a lot of potential um, in many businesses around the world. So 
I think that's a really a very cool one to to use. Okay, so, okay, so I'll the next one I want to cover is a mix of of language and also a vision. So recently computer vision has had a few advances from from the discipline of, of NLP. So in NLP we've been using transformers for a, a reasonable amount of time now. And in, transformers have, have proven to be incredible models for language. And very recently transformers have been applied to computer vision as well, which is very cool, I think. And what we're finding is that a, a model or an architecture that can be used for language can also be used for computer vision. And that's, well, I, I think that's super cool. So I want to show you one of those models or as briefly touch upon one of those models. We will go into it in more detail in a future article and video. But for now, I'm just going to, to mention it. We have the, the vision transformer, which is a very recent. It, I think the paper is January, 2021, if I'm not wrong. And although we don't need a vision transformer to build an embedding for an image, I think the fact that we can use it is, is pretty cool and we can really do it very easily with hugging face transformers as we will see when we when we go through the code now a very interesting use of this is to actually take two different encoders both transformers um the text encoder is more of a traditional transformer and obviously and the image encoder is our, our new vision transformer and we can actually train them together like we did with DPR, the bi-encoder architecture. And what we can do is train it to put images and language, so language that describes an image, and map them to the same point in a vector space, or, or very close at least. And, and that's what I've tried to visualize, as you can, you can see on the screen now. So we have two logs running, we process that through our text encoder, and we get a very similar vector to if we took the picture of two dogs running and process that through an image encoder, which would be our vision transformer. So I think that's, I don't know, for me, I think that's so cool. <laughs> now, I, I'm going to be using these three pictures that I got from Unsplash. If you, if you want to see the photo credits, they will be in the either in the article, if you're reading the article, or they'll be in the video description, if not. And what I'm going to do is we have these three pictures, we're going to encode those, and then we're also going to encode these three captions uh, and a few other captions as well. And we're going to see if they if they match. So we're going to perform a, a similarity or a cosine similarity search across them and, and see which pairs match the closest. And well, we'll see it's, the results are pretty Pretty cool, in my opinion. So let's let's jump into it. We again we're going to be using transformers, and we're going to be using a, a new model from from OpenAI, which is is for the image and and text, it's similar to DPR, where DPR is in question and and context encoding. Clip is using two encoders to do image and and caption encoding which is, is pretty cool. So we're going to do from transformers, import, clip processor. So I'm kind of viewing this processor as what we could call a tokenizer in the in typical like language transformers. And then we want the, the clip model. Okay, so this contains both encoders for us, so we don't have to mess around. Um, like we did DPR where we we were importing, you know, we imported four classes. Here we're just importing the two. And then what we want to do is we'll just initialize those. So again, very similar. So we do clip model from pre-trained. And in here we write open AI. Open AI. Uh, clip 
VIT, so it's the, the vision transformer, this VIT you see here, it refers to the, the vision transformer which Clip is, is using or is um, based on, at least the, the vision aspect. And we want to write base patch 32. So, I mean, we'll go into it in more detail, but the, the patch part of that is referring to the way that the, the model almost tokenizes your your images. It, it splits an image into, into different patches. And that's the, the patch size, the patch 32 there. So we also want the processor, which again, I can we can kind of see that as akin to our, or equivalent to our tokenizer. And we're just doing this for language models. And again, uh, I'll just copy that across. Okay, so model processor looks good. Let me, let me run it. Okay, again, I already have it cached, so it won't it won't download for me. Uh, and you'll you'll get this thing here. Don't worry about it; it still works. Now I'm going to copy in the the code I'm using to get the photos. So I have the photo URLs here. I'm using uh, pill to to create the the image object. And I'm using request to actually get the image from the URL that we, we have here. And then down here, I'm just going to show you what, what images we have. So I actually need to get um, matplotlib in there as well. So import matplotlib.py plot, it's plt, do we need uh, and numpy as well. Okay, and we'll see those images that we saw before. So we have the, the dog, the puppy or dog running, the dog hiding behind a tree, and then we have the two dogs running. Okay, so they are our images and we've stored them in, in images here, okay? And the next part are captions. So I've just written these, these six captions. The first three are actually <laughs> the captions and then the other three, I just, I made it up. Um, I included like trees and park in there because they, they look like, well, there's a tree here and there's a park here. So make it, you know, try and make it a little bit more difficult. Um, but I mean, they're reasonably straightforward still, I think. And then to create our, you can imagine, you can see these as, as tokens. Uh, we, we do inputs, so processor, similar to our tokenizer again. And we have, we have a few, inputs here so we have the text and we want to input our captions and then we also have images and of course we just input our images and then we want to return the uh, return tensors or tensor equal to pt and we set padding equal to true okay uh, return return tensors pt Okay, and if we, we're gonna have a quick look at what we have here. So we have our input IDs, pixel values, uh, and so on. So input IDs, we also have attention here as well. So these first two are for our text and then pixel values are for the images. And now what we want to do is create our encodings. So in here, because we're using the, the clip model, we're actually going to perform the encodings and it's also going to do the whole similarity uh, checking for us as well and identify which ones are which images and captions are the closest pairs or what it's going to do is go through each image and find the caption that it believes belongs to it so like before we just write inputs here and i think maybe let's have a look at what we have in our outputs so we can see We'll have a few things here that I think are pretty, pretty useful. So we'll the logits per image and per text. So for these, we can, for each of our texts, we can use this to get the most probable image that is assigned to each, each caption. And in logits per image, we can use these to find the most probable caption for each image. And then, so what we were doing before where we were just extracting the embeddings, we can also do that 
And maybe I'll just copy in the code for that as well. Uh, so we have the text embeddings here, so we can extract those if we want. And we also have the image embeddings in here as well. And then a little further down, we have the, the logits somewhere, pool output here. Yeah. So we have the, the pool outputs, not logits. Okay, so let me just close that. And I do believe we also have a few more. So let me let me just show you those quickly. Yeah, we have we have a few a few tenses there as well. Vision model output, text model output as well. Now what we'll do is I'm going to paste this code in, and so here I'm going to go for for image in in each image. I'm going to iterate through. I'm going to get the argmax, so the 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 caption that it believes or it's predicted for that image, and then we're going to show it. And we're going to print both out and let's see if they if they match oh so I've, i'm getting ahead of myself there so we also need to so the probability there is the uh, probs equals outputs and we want the logits per image and we'll take the argmax while we're here so dim equals one for that and let's have a look what we get we'll see that we we get this so it's, it's predicting caption two, caption zero, and then caption one for our three images. Let's loop through that and we'll see, we get a dog running, cool. A dog hiding behind a tree, and then two dogs running as well, which I, I don't know. For me, maybe because I, I'm usually working with language, I think seeing both language and images together is, I don't know, really cool. <laughs> super i don't know fascinating that it actually works like that so easily so another thing that we i want to show you very quickly i'm just going to copy the code in because i don't want to go through all of it um it'll take a while so we just have the embeddings so these are the embeddings if we wanted to extract them and do what we did before with them or if you wanted to take these embeddings put them in a like a vector index somewhere a vector database we can we can get our query. So I'm going to do a dog hiding behind a tree. We can get our the context or not the context, the the images, the image embeddings. Again, like before, we do the the similarity. So the cosine similarity. We get the highest one is the second one here. So it's looking pretty good. And uh, from there, we get our prediction, which is the argmax. So we're taking number one. And let's have a look what our prediction is then. So. We will plot that, we'll show you the image again. We have prediction, so it's showing us the dog hiding behind a tree for our query, which is a dog hiding behind a tree. So again, super cool. Now, that's it for this video. We've, we've I think, covered quite a lot of embedding methods. Uh, we've had a look at the sort of, uh, introduction to dense vectors with word to vec and where it sort of came from, how it quickly evolved. And we had a look at sentence embeddings and sentence transformers. Moved on to Q&A with Facebook AI's DPR. And now we've had a look at the new vision transformer and how we can use that with other transform models to build these really cool sort of cross media uh, embeddings that we can compare, which is sort of blown me away a little bit. Now, that's it for this video. But like I said, this is the first video and article in what will be a series on embeddings. So there's a lot more to come. But for now, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.